Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my um, honor and great pleasure to speak to um, such a distinguished, distinguished group of people here at the, um, foreign, uh, the uh, foreign Policy Association, representing diverse sectors of American leadership. I would like to express my gratitude to uh, President Noel Lati for organizing, organizing today's meeting with such distinguished co-speakers as the UN Under Secretary General Dr. Ibrahim Gambari and Professor Michael Doyle. Your association was founded almost a century ago in 1980, as it says there, and it has always aimed to serve as a catalyst for developing awareness, understanding, and informed opinion on the U.S. foreign policy and global issues. Since its inception, the association has witnessed the establishment of the League of Nations, the Second World War, the Cold War, and the post-Cold War period in the 1990s, and now the challenges of the post-9-11 world. I believe the association has made many valuable contributions in its noble mission to help enrich American leadership in foreign affairs. And for that, allow me to express my profound respect to your organization. Ladies and gentlemen, today I would like to touch upon some of the problems dealt with in the two important reports submitted to the Secretary General of the United Nations recently and share with you some of my perspectives based on my experience gained during my tenure as foreign minister, which ended not long time ago. Closely related to this is the question of UN reform, and must, most importantly, reform of the Security Council, on which I shall elaborate. Ladies and gentlemen, the high-level panel report on, on threats, challenges, and change produced by 16 eminent persons and so-called Millennium Project Report, authored by numerous development experts, led by Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, have been much commented upon. The former concerns the issue of a new international collective security, and we think it's con it contains excellent recommendations. The latter provides a plan to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, and we share many of the concerns raised in the report and support many of its observations. Taken together, the key underlying notion is the, that international peace and security issues are closely linked with international development problems in today's globalized world. The idea that there is a close interconnectedness between international peace and security and development is not new in itself, but the realization that this linkage must be squarely faced and dealt with realistically and effectively is perhaps enlightening. For example, poverty is not just a result of underdevelopment. It is closely related to underfunding of such sectors as health, education, and water, which are essential to nation building. Poverty is often both the cause and the result of failing governance, weak institutions, and corruption. And poverty-stricken populations confronted with social injustices and unfairness can easily fall prey to extremist influence and be exploited by international terrorists their communities becoming hotbeds for recruitment and training. We therefore should not be indifferent to the underdevelopment or poverty of a country, even if that country is remote from us. In the present state of interconnectedness, no one country, however powerful or wealthy, even a superpower, can effectively shield itself from the impact of linkage. Only through concerted action in, and international cooperation can the international community tackle such a wide range of threat, threats and challenges effectively. 
As far as Japan's position on the nexus of peace and development is con concerned, we are of the view that peace and development are two sides of the same coin. And Japan is fully committed to ensuring the peace, security, and prosperity of the international community by devoting itself to development cooperation. <coughs> Excuse me. Recent examples of such cooperation and reconstruction assistance in Iraq and our rapid <coughs> and our rapid response to the earthquake off Sumatra and the ensuing tsunami disasters in the Indian Ocean. Thank you very much. Water is important everywhere. <laughs> I can put it here, I think. Thank you. Um, the ensuing tsunami disaster in the, oh, okay, in the Indian Ocean. Japan has been addressing such critical issues in an expeditious and steadfast manner. Japan will also continue to make the same sort of resolute efforts to achieve the MDGs. To that end, we will strive to continue to increase the level of ODA, making Japan the biggest donor country in terms of the accumulated volume of ODA of it over the last 10 years. In addressing the issues discussed in the reports, the United Nations system must play a central role because it is the only universal body, and it is the only body that, it, that is so constituted that it can provide the kind of authority and legitimacy needed for the decisions it, it takes. Without such authority and le legitimacy, the world will find it difficult if not impossible, to garner the political will, mobilize the necessary resources, and deploy the needed capacity for truly global cooperation and an effective response. We acknowledge that the world body is in need of comprehensive reform. 60 years after its founding of its main organs, in particular the Security Council, in passing, I note that the United Nations bashing is again on the rise, fueled by the scandals involving the oil for food program in Iraq and reports of sexual abuse by UN peacekeepers in the Congo. There are all, they are all very serious damaging charges against the United Nations, and they must be vigorously followed up for effective response flaws and weaknesses found to exist in the organization must be addressed forcefully as well. For all these additional reasons, it is all the more important to reform the UN so that it will be a better and more effective body equipped to deal with the multifaceted problems and new threats and challenges of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to touch on several points that Japan considers of particular importance in addressing security and development challenges and seeking to improve the effectiveness of the United Nations. The first is consolidation of peace in countries in transition from conflict to peace and development. Prevention of conflict in the first place is of the utmost importance. But where a conflict has occurred, the United Nations is, is expected to assist countries emerging from conflict to find peace, keep peace, and consolidate peace. This is an area I paid close attention to as Foreign Minister of Japan, working closely with the United Nations and other partners. East Timor and Afghanistan comes, come to my mind immediately. Japan was also involved in Cambodia, Kosovo, and Sri Lanka, among other critical areas. The efforts deployed to assist these countries in transition have included assisting, foreign, assisting refugees and internally displaced persons, protecting civilian populations against the threat of landmines, helping former combatants to, to disarm demobilize and reintegrate into society, and providing rehabilitation, reconstruction and development assistance 
support for institution building. Large amounts of official, official development assistance have been mobilized to address the needs in specific circumstances. In this connection, the high-level panel report has advanced the interesting idea of setting up as a gap-filling measure in the United Nations system, a peace-building commission to provide a coherent strategy for the international community's response to challenges posed by the transition from war to peace. We support the idea in principle and believe that an innovative mechanism should be found that would effectively involve the key organs, particularly the Security Council and the Economic and Social Council, perhaps through establishing a joint body of the two. The second issue recognized as essential to addressing security and development challenges were advancing the concept of human security. As a critical element in our common efforts to meet the new threats and challenges that I described earlier. In this globalized world, no country and no individual can be free from threats, however strong the country may be or however tight the state security is. An approach that emphasizes human security seeks for ideas and measures to ensure the safety of each individual rather than the security of each state. The essence of this approach is protection and empowerment. And it is especially important that people be empowered so that they can stand on their own feet, from, free from threats. We have to recognize that we must address both freedom from fear and freedom from want. Then you may ask, how can we protect and empower the people? What are the concrete measures? Of course, each country, each community, each individual has its own environment, and the difficulties and threats each, each one is facing are different. We should not adopt a cookie-cutter approach. We have to devise a differentiate, differentiated multi-sectoral approach. Japan has launched the African Village Initiative, or AVI. This initiative, based on the position notion of human security aims at empowering local communities to meet their own needs in close collaboration with other partners. It will take the form of a combination of a core project, project and a series of multi-sectoral projects. For example, a school construction project is implemented in close collaboration with sporting programs such as school meal programs, will excavation and healthcare services so that the entire community is empowered with the school as its core. Experimental projects of this kind have already been implemented. I believe that this initiative will make a good case for the promotion of human security. Third, the high level panel report listed six threats that the international community faces namely poverty, interstate conflict, internal conflict, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, and transnational organized crime. However, our recent experience has shown that we also face a seventh threat, that posed by natural disasters. And the devastation wrought by the Indian Ocean tsunami in late December laid bare the nature and scope of this event. I mean, sorry, this threat. This devastating calamity affecting so many countries and people simultaneously has taught the world one lesson. While no force on earth can prevent natural events from occurring, it is within our capacity to take measures to reduce and minimize the impact of these events, particularly on the poor and the weak through enhanced international cooperation for disaster prevention and reduction, including early warning. Integrating disaster reduction in national development strategies is now recognized as essential. Prime Minister Koizumi's initiative for disaster reduction 
cooperation announced during the UN World Conference for Disaster Reduction held in Kobe, Japan, last month was an effort to, to promote this idea. Ladies and gentlemen, all the issues that I touched upon, <coughs> upon earlier must be effectively dealt with by the United Nations. However, would the United Nations in its current form be the most suitable organ for that undertaking? Last fall, our Prime Minister addressed the United Nations General Assembly and called for the creation of a new United Nations for the new era, a strong and effective United Nations that is capable of coping with the challenges we face in today's world. And he made it clear, along with the leaders of Germany, India, and Brazil, that those four countries would work closely together with the aim of gaining permanent seats in a reformed and expanded Security Council. Today, as citizens of the world's number two economic power, Japanese taxpayers contribute close to 20% of the United Nations regular budget as against the 22% share of the United States. Do you know that Japan pays more than the four permanent members of the Security Council, namely the UK, France, Russia, and China combined. Not limiting itself to financial assistance, Japan has also aspired to play an active role in global efforts to confront today's challenges, such as countering terrorism, fighting the spread of weapons of mass destruction, alleviating poverty, preventing infectious diseases, and halting environmental degradation. Paying heed to the provision of our constitutions, Japan has limited its international co cooperation activities largely to civilian, non-military domains, such as humanitarian assistance, development, and post-construction, I mean post-conflict reconstruction. And in recent years, we have engaged increasingly in UN peacekeeping operations and post-conflict peacebuilding missions authorized by the UN involving our self-defense forces, personnel, and assets. Secretary General Kofi Annan has called for reform of the United Nations to be completed within this year, and we support his call Member states have over these many years invested enormous time, energy, and resources to make the United Nations more effective and the Secretary's Security Council more representative and transparent. We believe the time is approaching for the member states to recoup this investment by taking concrete action and reaching a decision this year. As for the expansion of the Security Council, the high-level panel report has offered two options. Model A proposes expansion in both the permanent and non-permanent categories. Model B, on the other hand, avoids creating a new permanent category and instead proposes the creation of a new non-permanent category. Member states aspiring to become permanent members of the Security Council, including Japan, is in favor of expansion of both the permanent and non-permanent seats of the Council. It seems to us that the debate on this critical issue in the United Nations to date has demonstrated that there is a widely shared view that the composition of the membership must reflect the realities of today's world and not of 1945. This situation is an anachronism that must be corrected in the interest of the whole membership, especially if the important body that is primarily responsible for international peace and security is to be more effective and credible. Japan is grateful to the United States for its support of the legitimacy of Japan's bid to gain a permanent seat in the Security Council. In view of Japan's status 
as a close ally of the United States, its bid to acquire a permanent seat in the Security Council has positive implications for the pursuit of common agendas, such as the promotion of freedom and democracy in the arena of the United Nations, which represents multilateralism. As Japan and the U.S. demonstrated in coping with the issues in Iraq and Afghanistan, Japan's position as a prominent member of the Security Council is likely to further strengthen the Japan-U.S. alliance in the global context. As the 58th session of the General Assembly in September 2003, I um, proposed I mean, at that meeting, I proposed from the Tribune of the United Nations that the leaders of the member states make a political decision on United Nations reform in 2005, which marks the 60th anniversary of the inception of the organization. I remain hopeful, and this important task will be that this important task will be fulfilled. This anniversary year must be transformed into a year of real action and decision. We must not be disappointed, nor must we disappoint those voiceless hundreds of millions of people around the world who harbor the hope and expectation that the United Nations can help them meet their needs and hope. The United States and Japan have important shared work to do in this noble endeavor. I thank you very much for your patience.